All right, hello, welcome to this episode of DNLC Live, one of our bioinformatics sessions on RNA-seq with Jupiter. I'm Jason Williams, and uh, we have a new two-part series. So to get started, I'm gonna go ahead and get my slides up on the screen. Okay, and this is work not only by the DNA Learning Center, but also by the Genomics Education Alliance. This is one of the things uh, that the DNA Learning Center uh, is collaborating with, and we'll mention that a little bit later. Okay, so uh, we're broadcasting, of course, through DNLC Live, which is an experiment we're doing uh, during this time of lockdown. So please give us some feedback uh, in the comments to this video or on our website. Let us know what you think. Um, the the purpose of this uh, broadcast and these collection of broadcasts is really to provide genetics, bioinformatics, biology learning resources, uh, laboratory demos, short courses, and of course here we're going to do bioinformatics, uh, interviews from scientists, we're getting more of those, and some act uh, activities to do at home. Um, please, to find out more, go to our website, dnlc.cshl.edu, and look for our live section. Uh, and also make sure to like and share and subscribe on our various uh, social media platforms, including uh, YouTube, for example, where most of this content will be posted. You'll get a notification when things are new and available. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the DNA Learning Center, uh, we're located in uh, Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Uh, there are a number of uh, hands-on bioscience centers, either that the DNA Learning Center has itself um, created or partners that we've worked with and shared materials and resources all across the world. So we have uh, quite a big impact. And of course, we're part of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which is a world famous institution for molecular biology and genetics. Uh, so who is this for? Um, the audience here is for undergraduate biology students. That's who I'm going to be directly talking to. But I also would mention that if you are a teacher of undergrads, hopefully these are things that you can use in your classroom. Um, if you are an AP Bio student, because we know we reach a lot of high school students as well, uh, this might be a curiosity, might be a stretch, but it, uh, why not and see what you get out of it. Um, for this format, it's going to be two sessions of 45 minutes each, approximately. Um, you're going to be able to follow along with everything through Cyber. So that's the great thing about bioinformatics. Uh, you won't need anything more than a, a computer internet access. So if you're watching this video, you probably have everything that you need. Um, there are going to be some slides, and there's also an online version of this lesson, which I'm going to be using. So really, you can follow everything directly, and hopefully the video is an aid to you. And uh, if you get benefit from that, all the better. Um, there are a number of learning goals. They're very, very basic, um, really exploring and getting uh, an introduction. Uh, we're going to talk about an RNA-seq experiment. We're going to learn a little bit about the command line, uh, but we're going to use a tool called Jupyter to use other tools. Uh, and make the, the command line part of it a little bit less intimidating if you are just getting started with some of this. Um, as far as the lab setup, we're going to be using uh, a platform within Cyvers. Uh, so you need to get an account. And the account is free, but you have to sign up. So if you're watching this for the first time, go ahead to cybers.org and go ahead and sign up for a free account. That's really all you need. So intro to RNA-seq uh, with Jupyter. Uh, and this is going to be part one. And we're going to focus the science part of it on a little bit of background about the experiment. And also, we'll have enough time to get some data and look at the quality, or at least start to do that. Um, in today's lesson, like I said, introduction, example data, um, the sources, and QC. So I should have already clicked on this slide, but I'm behind. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is that I just did a, a three-part series on RNA-seq with DNA Subway. Now that's a different platform, and of course, obviously, I endorse it and hope that you would use it. Um, but I want to mention that because in this uh, series, to keep it shorter, um, I'm not going to explain a lot of the in-depth stuff that I really go into into that three-part series. So at certain times, if I mention go ahead and see the longer video, go ahead to YouTube or go to our DLC um, live site, and you'll find that there's three hours of content just about. Uh, so I really go into a lot more detail, a lot more depth um, than I'm gonna go in. Still though, we have two 
um, 45 to an hour, I usually go over uh, sessions. So you'll get something out of this, but for things I know I've already explained, uh, I'm gonna refer you to those videos. Okay, so we do wanna make the video somewhat self-contained so you don't have to look for everything um, back in those videos. So let me give you a little bit of an introduction to RNA-seq, which is a super popular, super important uh, experiment, very standard one now in molecular biology for really understanding uh, what's going on. Um, in RNA-seq, we're measuring the transcriptome. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we wanna understand what genes are active, in a cell or in a tissue, and also under what circumstances those genes uh, might be giving rise to, uh, you know, ultimately a protein perhaps, or some other type of regulatory function, we need to know what genes are actually being transcribed into messenger RNA. There are a bunch of other sections and edge cases and things like that, but I'm just gonna focus on um, the core uh, concept of if we can understand what's happening uh, to a gene, well, well, we need uh, one part of that's going to be looking at the messenger RNA. Um, to bring that back to a higher level concept, if we think about it, a cell that's in the liver has the exact same DNA instructions as a neuron in the brain. And the difference between those really is that those genes are different, although the genes and the DNA is the same, it's the expression of those genes that are uh, going to vary greatly between those cells. So in the liver, um, liver-specific cells and whole programs of, of development, metabolism, etc., uh, those are only going to be active in the liver and really not so much in the neuron and vice versa. So what does RNA-seq allow us to do? Well, it allows us to measure that transcription. And in fact, we call all of the transcription in the cell or all of the things that are being transcribed, all those messenger RNAs, mostly, uh, the transcriptome. And so that is all of what's going on in a cell or in a tissue. And we can actually look either the entire tissue, and if we want to sort of zoom in metaphorically, uh, we can even look at individual cells to see what's going on. And we use the abundance of the RNA transcript as a proxy for the activity of some cellular process. So in other words, if we're talking about an mRNA that's going to create an enzyme, then we assume that if there's more of that mRNA around, um, then perhaps more of that enzyme is being produced and maybe it's having activity. Uh, there are all sorts of variations. Maybe uh, at different times, uh, one or another isoform or version, uh, we know about alternative splicing might be, be produced in one circumstance. In another circumstance, maybe a different isoform will be produced. And so we can measure all of those different things and really understand a little bit more about what's going on. Um, and often in an RNA-seq experiment, we are trying to draw a direct comparison. Um, let's say, for example, if we wanted to look at cancerous versus non-cancerous cells, that'd be an example of how you might set up one experiment uh, in RNA-seq, but there are different ones that you could do. Um, so here's an overview. I'll give you an example. Um, in step one, we need to actually design our experiment. And uh, first, maybe not the last time I'll say in this video, go look at the previous ones I've made. Uh, you need to um, really figure out how to design the experiment properly so that you have enough material to actually um, spot the difference between, let's say, a control group and an experimental group. Now, once you have that RNA, the next thing you're going to do is you are going to um, go through some molecular biology to take that RNA and transform it into a sequencing library. So these are just the steps that you need in order to sequence it. We actually turn the RNA back into DNA. Uh, and then we sequence it. And the sequencing I've explained previously, so again, go back to the other video. And finally, you need the analysis, which we're going to spend our time on. Uh, so I mentioned that. I should have used the highlights, but I think you can understand, although you might not know that this is the sequencing machine oftentimes we're using, and then, of course, the uh, analysis. Um, what would you, what would this look like when you're done? Well, this is not necessarily an RNA-seq experiment, but it's, it's telling you very similar information. So here is a, um, an enzyme, CYP, and there's a 1A and a 1B version. So, so it's a cytochrome, and um, those genes are often involved in metabolism of drugs. And um, drugs could be medicine uh, in that sense, or drugs in terms of something toxic like cigarettes. Um, if you look at this bar graph, you could see that in people that did not smoke, um, the enzyme, the level of the enzyme, in this case, they're really looking at the protein. That's why I say this is not the RNA-seq experiment. It's much less in those who never smoke versus those who smoke. 
And if you could run a Western blunt, which is what they did in section A here, you would see the level of protein is much lower in people who didn't smoke and people who did. If we did the RNA-seq experiment, <coughs> pardon, we'd get much the same result. Uh, I suspect we'd get a difference in gene expression that that enzyme, which you make more of in order to process if you are exposed to more toxins like through cigarette smoke, um, you'll make more of that enzyme and therefore you'll have more of that RNA. And so it's a similar idea. And it turns out um, we know that this particular enzyme is very highly produced in lung tissue. And it's produced in maybe a few other tissues, but it's specifically um, you know, very highly expressed in the lung. Okay, so what are we gonna be looking at over the course of this two-part series? Uh, well, before I do that, I'm gonna say that this lesson is part of a collection of lessons from a group called the Genomics Education Alliance. Uh, and so we are uh, putting together a whole bunch of materials. So I want you to know that there's this lesson, but there's also a couple more that are related to it if you wanna go back. Um, we have a lesson on BLAST, uh, which is gonna use a, the, a very similar data set or at least looking at the same genes, you get to know this gene well. Um, and we also have one on genome browsers. And those are targeted a little bit lower. RNA-seq is really um, a little bit uh, more high level, or rather, uh, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, so if you're interested, you might wanna also go check on those lessons. So um, I'll mention at some point later uh, where you can find them, because or I'll put the link in the description as well. Um, what we're also going to be doing, and I'm going to explain it more once we see it, is we're going to use this technology or this platform called Jupyter, which I really like. So it's a platform that makes it easier to present, organize, and share code and command line tools. Because most of the tools we use in bioinformatics are actually at the command lines. If you've never used that, it might be a bit intimidating, but Jupyter really makes it easy. And it's not just used in teaching, although that's how I often use it. Uh, it's used in the sciences, um, not even just biology, quite a lot. Uh, so I'll talk more about that. Um, but for the uh, lessons to see everything, you can find us at this website. And if you are an educator and you're hopefully watching this video as an orientation perhaps to some of these materials, go ahead and join um, the lesson pilot. Uh, so we like some feedback and see how people like that. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at these lessons. I'm gonna get to there in a moment. Hopefully I include the link myself. Um, but here is the original paper where this data came from. So uh, this is in a cancer journal, Carcinogenesis, and they're looking at high fat diet induced leptin and Wnt expression, WNT, that's that gene. Uh, and they used RNA-seq to look at mouse colon tissue, including uh, tumors. So unfortunately, these are some mice who, uh, some of them have uh, colon uh, tumors. So you can imagine that they're studying colon cancer. And in this particular case, what they're looking at, um, the key thing that you need to know is that some mice are raised on a regular, ordinary diet for lab mouse, and some are um, on a high fat diet. And what you're actually seeing here are histology, histology sections of, um, of uh, mouse colon tissue. Uh, the first two are just regular colon, and the second are with tumor. Now, what might not be exactly clear is that uh, this sort of brown coloring is not random or not an artifact, but actually we uh, can stain uh, through different types of histology um, proteins. So in this case, this is looking at leptin and basically where you see brown, it's giving you sort of a visual indication of how much leptin there is. And the darker or the more um, brown that you see in this particular, the darker that the image appears, that's an indication that you're getting more leptin gene expression. Uh, as it turns out, leptin is a, I believe the Greek word means thin. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gene and ultimately a protein that's involved in um, feeling satisfied, uh, feeling you've had enough to eat. And so uh, you could imagine that different diets or different circumstances may make uh, mice and also people uh, more likely or less likely to overeat or to gain weight. Uh, and this is one of the genes that people study a lot uh, if you're concerned with that. Uh, and as you can see in the high, high fat diet, it looks like a little, a little bit darker. And also in the high fat diet where there's a tumor, 
we also see like there could be um, maybe some increased gene expression. But so keep that in mind. And uh, ultimately, we're going to be looking on the left hand side now uh, at some data, some DNA or really RNA alt uh, originally sequenced that we got from three mice uh, that were raised on the high fat diet and also from three mice that were raised on the um, regular diet, or rather um, high fat diet, both of them, but rather um, control, which means that they don't have a tumor, so regular tissue, and also high fat diet tumor. So these are all, excuse me, high fat diet mice, but we're looking at the difference really between these last, uh, uh, here is high fat diet with a regular colon, so that's image number two here, and image number four is high fat diet with tumor. And we're looking at three different mice, and we'll explain what this SRS number means in just a few moments. Uh, in fact, now's the time. So this data is not data that I produced. It came from this paper. Uh, it's data that you could produce if you had your own lab, but instead what we're gonna do is get that data from uh, NCBI. So, this is from the National Library of Medicine. There's the National Center for Biotechnology Information, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, which has been in the news recently. Um, and um, they house repository of sequence data for nearly every type of biological ex uh, sequencing experiment. In fact, uh, this graph here uh, shows the data uptick since, let's say, 2009. About 2008 is when this type of DNA sequencing became um, not only widely uh, used, but also quite um, inexpensive. And there's more than 40 quadrillion base pairs of DNA in this uh, repository, so quite a lot. So I'm gonna click on this link actually. And the reason why I click on that link is so that I can bring you directly to the website. And this is what it looks like. Uh, so where I'm bringing you is exactly where uh, these particular, this is, if you could see, it's got basically the same title as the original paper. This is where this uh, data has come from. And if I were to click on uh, SRA experiments, here are the data sets. There's 12 of them. We're not using all of them. So there's also regular diet uh, without a tumor. Um, there's a variety of diff different samples uh, that are there. We're only using a few just to keep the data not so big. Um, if I click on any given one of them, I get more information. And if I go to this thing called the run indicator, again, I'll see um, more information about who sequenced it, what they have, uh, all sorts of different things. Uh, I don't need to go so far back into it, but I just want you to know that's where this these sort of... Uh, SRR, SRS, all of those different numbers uh, come from. And it's also a little bit of a different, uh, you know, tells you a little bit about um, these mice who it looks like 60 calories, 60% higher calories for eight months. Okay. Uh, so you get some details here. Those, they're also in the paper. But I just wanted to show you where that data is coming from. We're going to actually download those data in just a few moments. Uh, okay. Um, so I at least mention, um, just to give you an idea of how that data was generated, is that let's say sample one and sample two represent our high fat and our control regular diet mice. Uh, those are sequenced. And from those sequencing, you get short pieces or short fragments of DNA. And what we're going to do, those DNAs represent messenger RNAs. What we're looking to see is do those short fragments line up more on one gene or another gene? Uh, and in fact, are they different between the sample one and sample two? And from doing some calculations, which I again explain a lot more, uh, especially I think in part two, part three of the last uh, video, um, uh, or the other ones I originally mentioned, uh, you get a sense of how this works, that we get those uh, sequence counts and we uh, can determine uh, is there more expression. So we're gonna be doing um, that. Uh, and again, this is all possible and it's a fantastic thing. I wish I had more time to talk about because this uh, process has become much cheaper and it's what makes personalized medicine possible uh, or the start of it now because every individual um, 
we can sequence things and find out something particular about even a cancer, let's say, maybe very different, uh, colon cancer between one person and another, if there are different mutations that drive those cancers. Okay, so in our lab, we're gonna do some importing of data from SRA. We need to get into the lessons, and uh, then we're gonna do the QC, uh, which are also on the lessons. So let's go back and let's access those lessons. I'm just going to bring them up here, and they're going to be linked in the description. Okay, and let me go back to share my screen again. Okay, uh, so this is the lesson. Uh, there's a little bit of information here, including some of the co-authors of this lesson. Uh, there are some things that are not filled in here because this is a pilot lesson, so we're not claiming that we have all the answers for those items yet. Um, but there is the very first step of our lesson. In fact, at the bottom of every lesson, there's gonna be a next page. So make sure that if you have any questions, uh, you use that next page. Um, so, and also it's really, I think, pretty nicely described every single step. So. Uh, in some sense, I'm not going to try to read word for word uh, what's going on here, but uh, consider this video a really great way to go through the lesson and then do it uh, on your own so that you can get the most out of it. Um, so the first thing it tells you is to click on this button and it's going to take you to the Cybers uh, website. Now, in my case, in fact, actually, I should actually log out just so you see a little bit more of how this really works. Okay, let's try that one more time. Now, remember you were told to get a Cybers account and there are instructions there on how to do that. Let's try that this way. Um, so it's gonna ask you to go to this thing called a discovery environment and you're gonna enter your Cybers username and password uh, and probably entering it correctly would be an even better way to get this to work. Now, uh, once you click on that button, uh, you don't really, although there's much I would love to show you about Cybers, and I, I'll put some links in the description, you really don't know, you don't need to know anything else about how Cybers works. Uh, but I should say, and I should go to the Cybers homepage, um, just to give credit to it, uh, because this is a large NSF project where you can uh, work to analyze your data. So if you're using this as a student, it's really excellent because you're really using the same uh, tools and data sets uh, that scientists use. And in fact, if you go back to Cybers and click on learning, uh, it'll take you to a whole bunch of other things that you can go ahead and learn more about um, what Cybers is and does and et cetera. So I encourage you to do that and you'll see some of my other webinars on Cybers if you do. But back to just focusing on this lesson and trying to make it all fit with the amount of time that we have, uh, you come up with this uh, box or this little uh, menu. You really only have to click launch analysis. I'm just going to show you. You don't have to do this. Uh, there's this thing called notebooks, which is, we'll explain what a Jupyter notebook is. This thing called data sets and this um, resource requirement we don't have to touch. So really when this uh, window comes up, you just need to click launch analysis. Now, when you click Launch Analysis, what you expect at the top of the screen is uh, a note that the analysis is successfully launched. And then I want you to pay attention um, to the upper right-hand side of the screen because uh, in the upper right-hand side of the screen, uh, in a moment or so, what you would actually get from uh, Cybers is a little link uh, saying, access your running analysis. Now, the truth is, uh, this will take a few minutes for it to be ready for you. So um, here comes my link. Uh, if I click on it now, I promise, I guarantee you, it'll take you to a page you're gonna be waiting. So it's actually copying a fair amount of data. It usually takes about five minutes. So just be aware that you're gonna have some time. I already have one running, so I'm gonna click on this one. And then I'm in this Jupyter interface. So this is Jupyter Lab, and I also only have a limited amount of time to take you through it. Um, but it is a way for you to go ahead and use things like, let's say using Python or R or whatever your choice of language is, or we're gonna be using Bash, which is the Linux command line. Uh, you can use it in order to analyze your data. In fact, if you click on the terminal link, 
Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the terminal, you get a terminal that you can just go ahead and use any kind of Linux command uh, that you would normally use. But in our case, I'm going to go ahead and click, and this is what you're instructed to do in lessons, is to go ahead and click on notebooks. And then we need to click on notebook zero. So they're labeled one through five. You really only use one through four. Five is some backup data. And then we're really in the lesson. Uh, so we're going to go through a little bit uh, back on the lesson here. I'm just going to point out some things. And then I'm going to go through some of the steps of the lesson. I won't necessarily do every single step. So this will be an exercise for you to try. But we will talk about results when it's important to talk about them uh, and make sure you kind of feel you know what you're doing. OK, so we've, we've covered this part on launching the lesson on Cybers. And it mentions that there's a backup notebook, notebook five. So if you, if you miss a step or something doesn't work right, uh, you're able to follow the instructions in that notebook to um, recover um, by skipping ahead and importing the answers essentially. So I'm going to go click on next. Uh, one thing I won't have uh, time, um, but it, there is a nice introduction here to Jupiter. We're going to actually see it rather than uh, go ahead and read this. Um, but go ahead and look through that because if you've never used a notebook before, uh, it'll be a nice um, explanation. I'm going to point those things out as we go through. The other thing that I will not go through here is an introduction to the command line. So we have a little bit of an introduction. It's by no means the only thing you would need to learn how to use it, but it gives you an idea of what some basic commands are. And I'll be explaining those um, sort of as we encounter them, but just know that this resource and reference material is here, and it's worth going through on your own. What we are going to, uh, what we've already also covered is a look at the transcriptome. But again, I'd encourage you to read this uh, because it has nice background information. Uh, and it also explains what we're gonna do in each notebook and what tools we're gonna use. And it's got the references for those tools. So it's really awesome to go ahead and look at that. There's also some nice uh, review questions that you could use. Um, and maybe you'll come to me in the comments of this video and, and let me know that you have some answers or you want um, some help with those questions. Okay, finally, we are at the NCBI Sequence Read Archive. So I've already explained just a little bit about what um, the Sequence Read Archive is. And um, what, what we already took a look at, although um, if I go ahead and just click on that link, it tells you that all of our data on the SRA um, if I go ahead and search, it would take you back to where those data sets are, which are, you know, largely public. So that's where we were. And um, it gives you some background on that. But what we're going to do, it shows you, this is not a real notebook here, but it's a preview of the notebook. We're going to do this right in the notebook. So we're going to go ahead and get started because we've got to get through it and we've only got a little bit of time left. Okay, so in the notebook, uh, in or, uh, what you'll notice is that there's often some explanatory text, but then there are also these things called cells. And a cell is a, a block of or a chunk of code that you could run. And so in order to get that cell to run, at the top you're going to press the play button and that cell is going to run. Now let me just explain what is happening. What's happening right now is that we're going to use a shell command called head, which shows the first few lines of a file. In fact, we ask it to show us the first four lines. And this is just the location of the, of the file and the name of it. It's something called SRA run table that text. So if I click on this cell, you can see it's highlighted blue, and I click play, it's going to spit out a whole bunch of junk. Uh, it's basically unreadable. But what this is, if I go back to the SRA, and click through eventually to where we were before. Uh, what it is, is in purely text format, it's basically the information that we saw about the experiment. And in fact, it's a way too much information for right now. Uh, it's not as neat a table, so let's make it a little bit neater. Okay. Uh, so to do that, uh, we're going to use the cut command. The cut command is designed to pull out one column of the data. And or the, here they're called fields. So we're going to just pull out field 10. And field 10 is the SRA sample. So this is the number 
uh, uh, or the ID for each one of the samples. And by the way, if you were looking for any data on SRA, you could follow exactly the instructions here to get this. So this notebook is something that you can completely customize. Um, so we want those numbers, um, but we want more than that because I don't know what numbers these correspond to in terms of our actual samples. So if I do 10 F uh, cut, this dash means I'm giving it an option. So the field option, and if I now say 10 and 11, what it's gonna do is give me the two columns next to each other, column 10 and column 11. And now this is much better because it's telling me that uh, here's my sample. And then in 11, it's telling me this is the regular diet, uh, this is the high fat diet and so on and so forth. So excellent. So um, what I really wanna do is I only wanna keep a certain number or certain one of those. So in order to do that, I'm gonna do this longer command um, I am first going to go ahead and cut those columns, so column F10, and then there's this thing called a pipe, which is explained here. I'm going to use another piece of code, so this is a separate instruction. So you can think of this as instruction one, get those two columns. Then here comes instruction two, so the way that we separate instructions is that pipe character, and instruction two is going to use this thing called grep, which grep, if you use the word Google, it almost means the same thing today. It means search for the word in quotes, high fat diet control. So it's only going to search for those words. And then uh, once we do that, we're going to cut again. So this is instruction three, where you see a pipe, it's another cut. We're going to cut again. And then these two little uh, carrots mean save that into a file. So I know uh, this all might look like shorthand, uh, but I encourage you to go back to our uh, primer on the command line and maybe take some courses if you haven't already. Uh, it, it would prepare you for a little bit about this. So, but for right now, don't worry so much about how to get them. Um, go ahead and just do them, but let me show you one trick, uh, which I should write into this lesson. This is why I end up going over um, not this one, let's go to shell explainer. Uh, this is why I end up going over time. Uh, here we go. But I'll put that into the lesson at some point. Uh, if I go ahead and copy this whole thing and then go into and paste it in this thing, explain shell.com and click explain, it'll go through and say uh, what is happening. It'll break down each and every uh, segment of this and explain what's happening. Uh, what all of those uh, sort of magic words mean, uh, if you will. Okay, so that's a cool little trick. Uh, let's see what that looks like. So uh, I'm going to run this one. And by the way, if you haven't paid attention, as I run commands, uh, this a number appears to let me know that I've just run this. It's the fourth thing uh, instruction I've run. And if you look on the left-hand side, if you're quick, I got this new file. If I double-click on it, called finalsamples.tech. So there were three that were pulled out. And in fact, so there are three things that have the word high fat diet control in our list, right? And that makes sense. If we go back here, high fat diet control, that's one of them. And there's actually three. We're gonna do that one more time, but this time we're looking for high fat diet tumor. So you can also hit control enter and that runs it. And now the cat command just prints to the screen final samples. So here are the one, two, three, four, five, six samples that we're gonna be working with. Now, we've got a choice. Um, we're gonna choose the quickest option here. If I go ahead and do an LS, what I'm gonna see is, whoops, um, what am I supposed to do? Oh, what I'm supposed to find out is that there is some data that is already uh, available for me um, that I'm gonna take a look at. So if I go back, it looks like that is in data slash pre-imported. And Got annotations. Okay, um, so we'll go back and we'll find that in the next notebook.
But uh, while I'm fixing that or going back to see where those things ended up, this is why this is live, let me mention to you that uh, there is a slower option, which we're not doing for a very good reason. It's because it takes a long time to do. But this is how you would get this data from, uh, from the NCBI. So there is this command, uh, which I'm not gonna run, but you could uh, and follow the rest of the sequences in this notebook and would directly download this data from NCBI. As I mentioned, I'm not doing it because uh, if I did, it probably takes about 20 or 30 minutes in order to run through all of those, uh, depending on your internet connection. But I wanted you to know that because let's say if you open, remember uh, just a moment ago, we had, uh, let's see, this final samples.txt. Uh, in fact, actually, if I look at final samples.txt again, uh, we had these numbers. If you wanted to use the rest of this analysis, but just change those numbers because you go into NCBI and found your own data set or something else you want to work with, uh, that's why I put uh, this here so that you could actually go ahead uh, and try it again. So what we're gonna do is go to the next notebook and we're gonna look at the rest of the data set, um, but we'll come back to um, the, the files are there. It's just uh, that file link was wrong. So I'll also have to correct that notebook. Okay. Uh, so let me just, uh, okay, uh, let me just re reload that. Um, back in notebook one. Okay, so uh, what we have done, or let's assume that we had gone ahead and did the whole import, uh, is we would have gotten uh, samples for the high fat diet control three different mice, so three replicates, one, two, and three, and also high fat diet with the tumor samples. And the files that we expect are gonna be these files called FASTQ, and perhaps next time we'll talk more about that, but I certainly uh, mention it, like I said, in the um, more extensive videos. So we're gonna use this program called FASTQC. Before we do that, let me just go back here, because we do have a slide or two about what we're actually gonna do. In some sense, you know, data import, although it's fascinating and interesting to learn how that works, it's really just getting the files to the right place. And I wanna minimize that. A lot of bioinformatics is moving your files to the right place, as any bioinformatician will tell you. Um, but the first sort of scientific thing um, that we would do, or really analysis that we would do, is quality control or QC. Um, so let me just talk about this for one moment. Uh, we're going to use this program called FASTQC, which gives us an in-depth look at our uh, individual re reads. And in fact, what we'll learn as we get more familiar with this data is that the sequencing experiment I mentioned earlier, let me just go back to a really early slide. What we get from that sequencing experiment um, is we get these short little pieces, uh, perhaps uh, 100 and 200 base pairs, not very much longer than that. Uh, and we have millions of them. So we actually need to investigate uh, each one and determine if it is of quality or not, because uh, the very first thing that can ruin our experiment is if our data are not of sufficient quality to go ahead with the analysis. No experiment, no analysis, no um, data generation is gonna be perfect. So in order to do that, we're gonna use this program called FASTQC and the key concept to that is that um, every single nucleotide in our uh, data set is going to have something called a FRED score. And a FRED score is a probability that the base has been um, miscalled. So a FRED score of 10, um, this is a log scale um, scoring system, means there's a 1 in 10 chance uh, that a base is miscalled. So it's 90% accurate. Now, ordinarily, 90% accurate maybe doesn't sound so bad, uh, but I'll get back to that thought in a second. Uh, a FRED score of 20 is 100, 1 in 100 chance that a base is miscalled. A C is, is, is called an A when it was really a C, uh, and so on and so forth. So, you, so the higher the FRED score, the better. That means more quality. Uh, typically, we're looking for FRED scores uh, close to 30, maybe even above 30, because that's 99.9% .9 accurate. Now, if you think about it, uh, the law, sort of the large numbers, 
Um, if 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, being accurate sounds good, but if you think about how many babies are born every day, well, if you only got it 99.9% .9 right, and 12 of those babies would give, be given to the wrong parents every single day, or it gives you an idea, uh, this is from one source, I'm sure these numbers have gotten worse as numbers get larger, um, how many um, books will have the wrong book cover, how many planes uh, will have unsafe landings, so on and so forth. So in the human genome, um, we're talking about three billion nucleotides, uh, that could be a significant amount of error. So let's see how we deal with that. And another good place to get an explanation is actually not only the uh, notebook, but also, let me make sure that's being shared, not only the notebook, but also the lesson. So let's do the process first. In order to do it, uh, we run this thing called FASTQC, and we do this LS step just to make sure that we see uh, these are our files. So we have a small file that's gonna be a nice little toy example for us, and then we have the individual SRR. These are the real data sets. Remember, they correspond to these ones up here, um, and we'll come back to those. So if we go into this directory where they're located, uh, in order to run the program FASTQC, it's very simple. Um, by the way, again, the CD command changes our directory, so we're just following along with the notebook. Um, we enter the name of the program, and then we enter the name of the file we want it to analyze. So when I go ahead and run that, it's gonna go ahead and analyze the data. Now, where are those data? Well, we need to go back to look for them. Uh, and on the left-hand side, I'm clicking these, uh, these uh, little notebook symbols to navigate. So let's go back to data. And in fact, we're in data, raw data, FASTQ. Okay, uh, and this is the directory. So if you ever are curious as to where you are and how you navigate, uh, it's gonna match what's up here although I'm uh, zoomed in quite a bit, but they will match if I'm able to zoom out enough. Am I able to? No, it just gives me back a little bit. So I end up with uh, an HTML file and a zip file. If I run this command, it tells me small fastqz.zip. So I see that one here and, and also the HTML file. I see that right there. Now, it says here that we can make a new directory. So we're gonna use the make directory command with this option that just uh, suppresses, uh, well, makes all the needed directories to get there. So I'm gonna go ahead and run that. And then I'm gonna go ahead and run um, the move command, which is gonna move these to a more suitable place. Right now we're in a directory called FASTQ, but those are the results of our analysis. They're not FASTQ files, which are the results of our uh, sequencing reads. We're gonna move them to a nicer place. Okay, now that we've done move, if we go back here, and we look at our RNA, we have a new folder called RNA-seq project. And now we have one called FASTQC untrimmed results. Now if I click on, the, well double click on it, what I get is this FASTQ report. And I need to go through this in order to understand what I'm looking at. So I'm gonna go through this one briefly and then there's really an exercise for you to fo follow through as basically we're gonna get through this and then that's gonna be our time for this episode. Um, what I get back is, it tells me this uh, report, the name of the file, uh, that these are Illumina sequencing. And in this case, this is only 50,000 reads. But what it does is it gives us an average of all 50,000 reads. And what we see here, uh, let me zoom out just a little bit. On the bottom, the x-axis, we have the position. So these reads, if I actually go, the mean, the length of these reads are 100 base pairs each, 101. So here's the first base pair, and of these 50,000, this is what it's showing me. Um, the, the mean or the uh, median, well, you can say mean at the center of this box plot here, somewhere around 32. So at the very first base pair, on average, we have a 32 FRED score, which is great. Now, what tends to happen in Illumina sequencing, and we see here, is that as we go longer and longer, as that sequence read gets longer, the bars, which gives us the range of, um, uh, of FRED scores, uh, these are getting bigger and, and, and bigger. So for example, when you go here to 78th uh, base pair, you have a large proportion of our 
sequences that have a FRET score somewhere around 26 or 28. Um, that's not horrible, but you also have, uh, since you do have some bars here at the bottom that are um, really, really low, that means as we're getting towards the end of our sequence, we have some bases that may be uh, of, you know, more highly miscalled. In fact, the very last one, the median, uh, this is red, red bar here, is 16. So these are really terrible. So most of the data is nice, though. So you could think of this, if they use analogy of cutting the crust, crust off of a piece of bread, we don't want this part, uh, so we may want to trim this, but these parts look good, and that's an exactly what we're going to be able to do. Um, so if you go through, um, each one of these reports has a little bit of an explanation. Um, this we don't need to worry about. That's the sequencing machine itself, essentially the tile. Uh, there's no blotches on this. Um, and if we go and look at the average quality for a sequence, we see the, the large proportion area under our curve is up here at 34, 36, which is really nice. But of course, there are some that are lower. Now, I don't have time um, to be effective in explaining all this, but thankfully, what you can do, if I find the right uh, tab here, Or have I closed it completely? Oh no, here it is. Back on the um, lesson here, just go to the next page on sequence quality. And this is certainly Daniel C. Live. We've had trains and police cars. Uh, but from here, you'll go through uh, not only a nice explanation of what a FASTQ file is, uh, but you'll go through and you'll see the information on the FRED score and how to interpret the key reports. We don't need to necessarily look at all of them, but this per base sequence quality and per sequence quality scores and adapter content and et cetera. So I think that's all the time that we have for this episode. I wanted to keep it under an hour and we could go further, but I want to um, not rush through it. Um, we are, I could make this easily three or four episodes, um, one for each one of them, but I wanted to make it so that you could watch these two things and get enough to get started and really have a guide to the lesson. In the next one, what we're going to go through is trimming and filtering, uh, and that is going to um, be interesting, and then we're going to align those data and visualize them. We won't cover as much as background to keep the episodes uh, sort of short. Um, but with that said, uh, let me just see if there's anything else I want to cover. I think, let's go back to the slides. The slides is just going to summarize that uh, what we're going to do next time is going to be the alignment to reference and visualization. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then um, what I'm going to do is point you back to the lessons, have a look at what we've covered so far. Uh, what I thought is interesting is we were able to use a few command line tools and you didn't have to type the commands yourself. Now, although I won't directly cover it in this series so much, uh, the point is, is that once you see what those commands are and you start to get familiar with them, then actually typing them or understanding how they work at the command line is a little bit more easy. So we'll get to that next time. Uh, and hopefully this is a nice introduction. And as I said, go back and watch those earlier videos that I did on RNA-seq in depth, and you can get even more into some of the science on that. Okay, thanks. <laughs>